Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to UK Dreamers. Today I'll be discussing about the emergency medicine training pathway and to join me is a very special friend of mine, Dr. Ivan D'Souza. So Dr. Ivan, welcome to the channel. Uh, thank you, Aman. Thank you for inviting me over to your channel. Thank you so much. And it's it's a, indeed a pleasure. So before we proceed ahead, uh, I and Dr. Ivan want to make a disclaimer that uh, we do not represent the NHS, not the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Uh, this video is basically to create more awareness for the foreign graduates who are coming to the UK and want to pursue a career in emergency medicine, how to get into training, what's the training all about, the advantages and the disadvantages, and of course, the take-home pearls from Dr. Ivan. So, uh, Dr. Ivan, please uh, introduce yourself first, please. Uh, nothing much to introduce. Uh, so um, I, I I like to call myself as the oldest newcomer because I did my MBBS. I started my medical career back in 1997. Um, 1997 to 2003, I completed MBBS. I worked for a few years of post internship. Uh, then in 2005, I did my MD in internal medicine. I completed that in 2008 worked for three years as a consultant in internal medicine in India. And thereafter, I went uh, to uh, the Middle East. I went to the Middle East and I worked for five years. And thereafter, in 2015, I came to the UK. Um, I worked in the Middle East uh, for five years as a specialist in accident and emergency medicine, as well as in the short stay unit. Uh, which was actually part of the acute medical team. And thereafter, I came uh, to the UK on a non-training pathway, which was called uh, Work, Learn and Return, an Overseas Development Program, ODP. I think that scheme is now closed, but it is quite similar to the MTR or the Medical Training Initiative, MTI, the, the Medical Training Initiative that is currently ongoing. So I was in a non-training career grade uh, uh, pathway for three years once I came to the UK. And thereafter, I moved into training and I moved into uh, emergency medicine training because that was always my passion. Uh, and I am currently a high specialist trainee in emergency medicine in the West Midlands. Oh. That's quite a roller coaster because being from internal medicine and jumping into emergency medicine, you must really be the emergency peep, the classic nerdy um, emergency peep, I would say. I, I don't think I'm, 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 I'm very nerdy, but uh, I'm probably the, the person who knows which patient genuinely has to go to the medical team. It's not everybody is referred medics. <laughs> Probably like most of the guys like me who have come to the UK system do not understand the term medics because when I started in the ED, so the nurses came to me said, are you a medic? And I was, yes, I'm a medic, you know, and they bombarded me with so many questions. Then I eventually came to understand medics is a different world in the UK. Okay, so, so let's go ahead. So uh, you've got uh, quite, uh, you know, vast career. So why did you go for the emergency medicine training? Like you, like you already had a post-graduation in internal medicine. You worked as a consultant. So what made you go into the training per se in the UK? Okay. So let me make one thing absolutely clear. Before I came to the UK, I was blissfully unaware about a certain thing that is called the NHS training pathway. I did not know that there was a set way to become a consultant in the UK. Mm -hmm. I thought that if you work for a few years, you can become a consultant, which is partially correct. You can become a locum consultant without the requisite, without the prerequisite uh, fellowship and membership exams, but you will not be on the specialist register. And it does put you at a greater risk of litigation if you do not have the qualifications to back your being a consultancy. Okay, okay so, so how did you get into the basic training? Like, uh, could you please give a basic insight? Like, Yes. Um, so uh, in order to get into training, 
if you are a fresh graduate in the UK, I would advise to stick to your first job, which will probably be a non-training job for the first six to nine months. Thereafter, you need to do two things. One is you need to collect your foundation competencies. There are a number of terms that are used for it. Some people call it a crest form, or it's just F1, F2 form. You can find these forms. But you need to spend about six to nine months in the trust that you are working first in order to get that signed off by a substantive consultant who is working in emergency medicine or any, any substantive consultant who has worked with you for a definite period of time. The second thing that you need to do is you need to uh, have an account on a portal called Oriel. Okay. And once you make a portal on Oriel, it will go through all the things that you have done since your MBBS, since your internship, and they will populate all of that. And then at the end of it, you can thereafter choose which subspecialty you want to go for. Now, when you want to join into training, you can join into training as, uh, so you can join into two types of training broadly. One is GP training and the other is subspecialty training. And uh, GP training as of now is three years. I understand that that's going to be five years shortly. Uh, and specialty training varies from between six and nine years, depending upon which specialty you're doing. Uh, when you enter into specialty training, you can enter into two dedicated pathways for training only. And this is, I'm not talking about Caesar. One of my good friends, Dr. Noel, has already spoken about Caesar. So I'm not going to go into that. Uh, when you're talking about training, there is ACCS, which we will be talking about in more detail. Uh, that stands for Acute Care Common STEM. And thereafter, there is a run-through training, which is what I am doing. And thereafter, there is specialist training, which you can start at ST3 or ST4 level, depending upon what you want, which includes ST3 in DREAM as well. That is a defined route of en uh, entry into emergency medicine. Yeah. Um, I do not want to go into the bits and bits of all all the different types of training. So I will stick to ACCS and run through. Okay. Please. ACCS and run through. ACCS run through is a six year training program. I started at ST1. When you say ST1 is specialist training one. And every year provided you complete your adequate competencies, you move into a second year, so that is specialist trainee two, three, four, five, and six. And thereafter, if you want certain subspecialties can be seven or eight, or and then you can become a consultant soon after ST6 if you, if you feel so. In the UK, by and large, ST1 and ST2 are SHO grades, SHO as senior house officer grades. ST3 is more of a middle level, wherein there is a transition between an SHO and a registrar. ST4 4 and above are called HSTs, HSTs, uh, which is higher specialist trainees. And uh, they are called as a registrar grade or senior trainees. Once you're an HST, you are considered a senior trainee. Um, and uh, at the end of ST6, hope for if, if all your competencies and your exams are done, you will get a, uh, a certificate of specialist training, CCST, and certificate of completion of specialist training. And that will put you on the specialist register and that will make you a substantive consultant wherein you can practice uh, emergency medicine at a consultant level anywhere in the UK and of course other countries with that degree. Okay, so basically it has to be minimum six years extending up to eight to nine years, depending on the subspecialty that you're getting added to it. Okay, yes. uh, this year I was uh, getting like, uh, uh, they need a crest from like 
per se if i went to training i need a crest form i need to sit for the msra exam as well have some basic competencies as you said and some portfolios and then they would weigh upon whether i am like suitable to get a post or not so so what's yeah. the advantage per se like uh, because i made a video about dream pathway as well with dr dalvi and like what's the basic advantage if we go for the acca is rather going for the dream okay uh the advantage of accs as compared to dream is accs by and large gives puts you on the specialist register with the cct okay and um now i am not 100% sure whether that cct is given by dream or you get a cp <laughs> okay it is an equivalent qualification but a certificate of completion of training especially if you are trying to go to the middle east some some hospital some hospitals who insist that you would they would prefer a cct uh, moreover the difference between uh, doing accs is that provided you complete your prerequisite exams and you complete all your requisite qualifications you will get your definite rotations and at the end of 6 years provided you put in your hard work you will definitely become a consultant i i do not want to advise or dissuade any good anyone against caesar uh, but the difference between accs and caesar is just one year and the risk for that one year i was willing to take uh to to just start at the start at the basics and go back to the basics and start as st1 and uh hopefully in another 3 years we'll make consultant okay so what are the biggest advantages of being in a training like uh being in accs run through program you do not have to reapply at st3 in order to join higher specialist training Okay. Now, most of the other subspecialties, where it, whether it comes to medicine or surgery or what, so on and so forth, they call it CT one, CT one, CT two, and CT three, which is mimicking ST one, ST two, and ST three. C stands for core, S stands for specialty. So it's core training one, core training two, core training three. Now, at the end of core training three. you have to again go back to oriel which i mentioned earlier and reapply for those hospitals that have got opportunities for training again when it comes to run through program accs run through you do not have to reapply when you start your career on the year 1 pathway there is a definite end to that career at the end of 6 years and usually you will become a consultant unless you have got certain extraordinary circumstances okay so the biggest advantage that you say you get in and you get out and the 6 years are basically you know very well planned and very well structured probably like you give your part and they would do their part and you get through the training smoothly Okay. Uh, I've also heard that if you get into training, there is a separate study budget. For instance, like if I were to do ATLS here in UK, I'll still have to pay around nine hundred pounds for the fee plus the traveling expenses and everything. Do you have to pay those when you're in the training? Like, yes. So when I'm in training, I do have to pay for it, but it is reimbursed. Okay. Now make no mistake. Even if you are a non-trainee. there is a study budget allocated to you uh, it is definitely not as much as trainees because at the end of the day the salary for the trainee is actually coming from the deanery okay so so what uh, what actually happens is that whatever the deanery provides the candidates to the to the institution mm-hmm. that those funds are actually being refunded back to the trust so mm-hmm. so they are literally getting free doctors 
Okay. And therefore, service provision is not one of the main things that, that are looked at for a trainee. When you are a trainee, you are there to, to learn. And nobody will try and take away your learning opportunity for service provision, if that yes. makes sense. Yeah. So, so basically, you're protected. That's what you're saying, the exact word, to be honest. Yeah. You're, 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 you're strongly protected. However, if you show an adequate uh, interest in providing the adequate service provision for, say, your sick patients, and they know you're a combination of both, nothing like it, the, 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 the staff like you, and uh, they know that, yes, this gentleman is or this lady is a trainee, and they are willing to work, and at the same time, they are willing to teach and learn as well, and 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 that is it's a, it's a remarkable place to be in uh, there's no pressure and you enjoy your work and i do enjoy my work okay so so what are the disadvantages if you would say like of going into a training like um i, I really struggle to find any disadvantages in, in training to be honest mm -hmm. um perhaps one of the disadvantages one might say is well he's a trainee to be honest in the last six months, I haven't found anybody training me to do anything. You you do things that a lot of the onus of learning is on you. So say, for example, you put a chest tube, you know your people around you, you know your consultants, you tell them, just supervise me. I don't need you to be standing over my shoulder, even if you're behind the curtain and you come, you see, we put the chest tube, he comes, he takes a look, it's bubbling. Okay, it's signed off. Mm -hmm. So... So it's not like somebody will, will try and put too much pressure on you, but you've, uh, you've, you've got the leeway to, to, to see which patients you want. Say, for example, uh, you want to do ankle examination because you've not, you've not, say, reduced an ankle in a long time. Uh, and you say, yes, I know that this patient uh, is four patients down the line, but I want to do an anchor. Nobody will tell you no as a trainee. As a non-trainee, if you say you picked up some other patient whom you wanted to learn, they'll say, well, there were three patients before them. They've been waiting to see, to see a doctor for three and a half hours. Why have you skipped those patients? And uh, that is one of the disadvantages. But I, I, I re I'd really struggle to find uh, any disadvantages of training. When you, when you pick up the phone and talk to somebody and say that you're an ST3 registrar or an ST4 registrar, it automatically comes that you have got that amount of seniority. So they know and they, they, they just, uh, it's, it's a breeze, trust me. It's a breeze. I have heard that if you are in the training, you, you usually rotate into different hospitals, different trusts, yes. different regions. How challenging yeah. is that? Like, you know, traveling one hour every day, like to a place, doing your shift, which is quite busy in the ED and returning yeah, yeah. back to your home, which is again one hour away. How, how do you find it like? Well, uh, to be honest, I am I, I'm traveling about an hour each way at the moment where I'm working because um, my workplace is about an hour from home. Mm -hmm. But um, I personally find the drive quite relaxing. Uh, it, it helps you to reflect on what you've done throughout the day. Sometimes if you want to listen to certain uh, you know, blogs or something, I just put the audio book on and it's playing on Bluetooth. And then I know what, to, uh, I know how long it is. So 45 minutes down the line, I finish the book and I'm ready, and then and then I start work. And on the uh, and and I would say that a, a small drive after a stressful day at work definitely helps you unwind. Um, having said that, um, yes, it is a little bit challenging because every new trust that you join will have a new system. Every six months or every year, you will join. Uh, a trust and they will not know who you are. They will always keep their distance and try and gauge you first. And they will, they will try and poke and prod and see how well can we bend this person. But, um, 
Thus far, I haven't had much trouble. Uh, I have rotated in two trusts so far. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start the fourth year. So uh, it, it's not like you have to uh, every year move a different hospital. I have gone to the same hospital on two separate occasions. Okay. So, so uh, one more interesting thing. Like if you're traveling one hour down the lane, uh, what about the expenses? Like, uh, what, what's the fuel expense like? Because that would be coming a lot higher. <laughs> Petrol, like here, quite is quite expensive if compared to other nations. Like, um, yes, uh, but you've got to be intelligent in which car you buy. Um, so uh, the car that I drive gives me about sixty-five miles to the gallon, especially especially on the motorway. Um, uh, what that translates to my friends in India is about 20 kilometers per liter. Mm -hmm. um, and I am eligible for fuel expenses. It is a little tricky how to claim those expenses back. Um, what you can what you can do at least this is what the rules that are in force at the moment and they keep changing. For the first 20 miles, they do not reimburse you at all. So that is assumed to be an acceptable distance to travel. Mm -hmm. Anything above that will be paid to you. Uh, I travel 32 miles, so I claim 12 miles to and 12 miles fro on each journey that I do. So I can claim about 24 miles every day that I come to work which translates to about three and a half pounds. But uh, when you look at it, the big picture over three months, it is it is a fairly significant amount, about 400, 500 pounds. This is another advantage of being in a training that your deanery is practically taking care of the travel yeah. expenses as well. Yes, and this is, and, and I, I must reiterate, this is only for trainees. Uh, Non-trainees do not have this luxury. Yeah. So, so uh, okay, uh, what are your take-home pearls for people who want to pursue training in a and &E in the UK? Take-home pearl number one, if you do not have your exams, start at ST1. If you have your exams, try and get your ST3 competencies and join ST3 or ST4. If you have got a chip on your shoulder that you do not want to work as an SHO because of whatever seniority you have, then you can consider the dream pathway because you start at ST3, even though it is only one year less than the six years of uh, run through training, because you will do ST3 for two years on the dream pathway and uh, you will do ACCS for six years. So it's a five-year dream pathway and it's a six-year ACCS pathway. And um, that's it really. I, I can't think of anything else. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ivan, for giving up basic insight about the emergency medicine ACCS run to training, the basic added advantages and the few disadvantages that we talked about. And uh, yes, uh, I would encourage all my viewers that if you have any further questions, you can drop a message. I'll ask Dr. Ivan if he can, you know, give us some his valuable feedback as well. And for any of the queries, please, you can draw, drop a comment in the section below. Please subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends. And thank you so much, Dr. Ivan, for giving your valuable time. Uh, I am very, very sure that this would be, you know, clearing the myths surrounding the training for the uh, like in emergency medicine in UK for most of the guys like us who are coming from a different system and you know not aware about the the way things work in the NHS and in the UK specifically. Okay, thank you everyone for having me. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye bye.